Lucky you. 36 Turn pistols and golf. Alternate Shots Podcast. Barney's Army. Where we talk about golf. Sandy. Poker. James Bond. Horse racing. Double. Classic movies. Zenyatta. We have no script. Down the stretch they come. We are glad you joined us. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> Billy Regan, this is part two with our esteemed friend and colleague and Wingfoot member, Bill Harmon. And we were just leaving off talking about caddy stories. And Bill was nice enough to talk about some actual in competition experiences with Jay Haas. And I looked up, Jay finished fifth in 1985 in the Masters, Billy. 86, he came in tied six, 94, tied fifth, and 95, tied third. Hopefully yeah, that's that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. So the caddy element, the, the one you were talking about in the first episode, where you're doing your homework for the next 10 questions you're going to have on the next hole mm-hmm. is awesome. I often wondered why caddies, now they had to get out of the line of play, right? Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about that. Just getting out of the line of play, how important that is when you're on a green. Well, when you're anywhere, caddy, of course. if you're playing in a threesome, you know, you have to be totally aware of where every other player is at all points, even just on the fairways and stuff. So you're never kind of either in their line or sight or, you know, where they can see you in their peripheral vision. Uh, I remember caddying one time at Hilton Head and Jay was playing with Gary Pyre. And we were on the sixth hole and, and Jay hit first, hit an iron shot. We were maybe 10 yards behind Gary and to the left of him. And so I raced up to get the divot. And as I was coming back, Gary was already over his ball. <laughs> and he looked at the hole and he, out of his peripheral vision, could see me. And he stopped. And uh, in all fairness to Gary, he went back to his bag and acted like he was wiping off his grip. But basically, I had disrupted his routine. And uh, walking up to the green, I apologized. I said, I'm sorry. I. I don't have an excuse. I know better. And his exact response was, uh, no problem. I don't expect everything to be perfect. So I thought that was interesting with his, you know, powers of positive thinking, because that's pretty much how he went through things. So uh, it's funny. I was uh, had Jay Haas over at our house for dinner last week because a senior event was here in town. And uh, his son Jay was there and we were talking about players and he had played with a certain player that day that, you know, he could see everything and somebody moving 500 yards away. And that drives Jay nuts. Some of these guys that, you know, and I said, the thing that I've never understood is that if someone drops a golf bag down in the player's line, let's say, I don't understand why that bothers the player because the golf bag can't move right? So if there was a tree back there in their line, they're not going to ask somebody to remove the tree. So it always bothered me why uh, something that wasn't moving would bother these players. But you do think of it and you do put the bag down because that wouldn't bother me one bit. It wouldn't even be on my radar because the the bag's not going to move. It doesn't have legs, you know. Mm-hmm. So I can't figure out why a stationary object would bother a player, but the players are very, very uh, all, you know, they used to say that Montgomery heard everything and Sergio heard a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, so even when you're caddying, you almost have to read the group. And uh, funny thing, you know, if you watch tournaments on TV, a lot of times a player will hit out of the bunker and while that player's caddy is raking the bunker, uh, one of the other caddies will clean the ball for him. Right. And for some reason, Ballesteros would never let you clean his golf ball. <laughs> this was one of those quirks. So once we knew that, we would, the, the two caddies, obviously, that weren't with uh, Seve, we would joke on the first hole, you know, let's make sure at all points we go up and ask if, you know, please, Mr. Ballesteros, can we have the honor of cleaning your golf ball? <laughs> Because we knew that he was going to kind of blow us off, you know. So we actually would do it on purpose to have fun with it, you know. And so, you know, I'd say to the other caddy, all right, it's your turn this all, you know. (laughs) So we were actually doing it on purpose to bother him a little bit. And every time he waved you off, every single time he waved you off. 
That's a nice and version. After a while, he waved you off with a little bit of uh, venom in it, I'd say, yeah. in the wave, but we were doing it on purpose just for that reason. Is the story <laughs> true or is it le urban legend? Johnny Miller, Ballesteros. Well, story. actually, it was Tony Johnstone. Okay. South African pro. And uh, I actually heard this story uh, in 2015. Jay Haas created a place for me to be on the President's Cup team so I could be part of the festivities. And John Stone was one of the assistant captains for the international team. So one day they were in the team room before the event started, uh, all the captains, and they were just swapping stories. So I asked Tony about that. And I think it was a, uh, I've seen this whole lot on TV. It was in Dubai and it's a dog leg left par five and they have to drive over these trees. So you don't really know where your ball comes down. So there was a ball in the fairway and then there was a ball in the left rough and it was right up against a tree. And John Stone went through this big thing. There was a sprinkler head, you know, about five yards away. And he said, you know, Sevy, you know, I got to hit this shot. And, you know, he did this crazy stance and Sevy, no, 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 it's normal stance. And he said, what if I hit a left-handed, you know, I'd have to stand like this and no, 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 normal stance. So uh, John Stone said, so you're telling me if I called for a ruling, you would be against me getting a drop. He says, why, of course. And John Stone said, good, it's your ball. Because <laughs> <laughs> Sevy had a reputation, um, I'm not going to say of cheating, but they, he was the European tour at one point. He was the Arnold Palmer, let's say, of the European tour. And they felt that he could intimidate uh, the rules officials. There are some people that thought Arnold could do it in his heyday. You know, the drop he got at 12 years ago, you know, when he beat Ben Turi by a shot. Uh, still, not too many people understand that, but then the story got better with John Stone. It, it was a par five, and uh, Tony ended up laying up. Sevy chipped it out, whatever, hit it over the green and made five. And John Stone laid up, hit it on the green, and three putted and made six. And walk into the, I guess they'd played the back nine first and walk into the first tee. Sevy says, See what happens when you mess with me, you see. <laughs> your, your game fall apart. So, he actually told the story, yes, Sevy uh, would take advantage of the rules, but he said they were actually good friends and actually always had bunker contests. So he said it was kind of funny that at the end of the day, Sevy beat him on the hole. Yeah. <laughs> so he might have saw some humor in that. Yes, yes. At the end of the day, but probably not at the time. Do you think you could have ever caddied for your father or would that have been uh No, that would have been easy because... You wouldn't have to tell them anything. The caddies, the, the players never asked the caddies anything. And they didn't have yardages. They didn't have pin sheets. And so, you know, basically you were just toting the bag. Uh, I don't think, um, I, don't, I tell you, I never heard Jack Nicholas ask a caddy a thing other than the yardage, the yardage numbers. In the, in the years I caddied when he had Angelo, I never heard him discuss a club selection. Um, uh, there's a very famous video, I think it's 76, the year he made the big pot at uh, 16, uh, the, yep. the Weisskopf Miller uh, Masters. And it's about a two minute video of him trying to figure out what club to hit on uh, 15. And I don't think he ever asked Willie Peterson one thing. He was doing all of his own homework. So, um, you know, you can make the case that the really great ones didn't need a caddy. But nowadays it's different and I get it. And uh, there's so much more information out there to process. Um, so the players today are used to having coaches, used to having caddies. Nothing bothers me more when a guy shoots a good round and he gets interviewed and he keeps saying, we, we did this, and we did that. That bothers me for some reason. I just think the player, uh, the player should always be in the spotlight. And as good as you might caddy, um, uh, and I say this, and this bothers tour caddies a little bit, but 
I say a good a good caddy and a bad player is still a bad player. Okay. Uh, a good player and a bad caddy is still a good player. <laughs> right. Now, if you happen to be both, you might be able to help a little bit. Right. But I don't care how good you caddy. If your player can't play, it doesn't make any difference. Zero, zip, nada. So, so what about this um, Webb Simpson and Paul Desori parting and T Paul Desori going with Cam Young? What are, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? That's, that sounds interesting. Well, Paul is really, uh, he's a good player. He's really into it. And he's very positive and he knows the game and uh, he knows the courses, which is, I think, a big deal for a caddy to have been on these courses a lot. Um. <clears throat> Probably knows what to say, when to say it. Um, I also think that it, it didn't come down this way, but, you know, Caddian's a business. And Webb isn't exactly in the prime of his career. So he's kind of on the, uh, not that he doesn't have some good golf left in him, but Cam Young is, you know, a rising star. So... I think it's a very good financial decision for Paul to go go from uh, Webb to Cam. And so a lot of those things factor into it. Uh, it sounds like it was a very uh, friendly split. Sounds like uh, Webb was on, on board with it. But I also think sometimes when you've been with the same caddy and the same player for a long time, it's almost like coaches. Your, your message gets stale. You get tired of saying the same thing. The player gets tired of hearing the same thing. And sometimes a new voice, I think, uh, is really what players are looking for in a coach sometimes. And, um, you know, I think Butch has been fired by five number one players. And I used to joke with him. I said, well, it'll be interesting to see who takes him to number zero. <laughs> I think it's just the greatest thing in the world to be fired by a number one player because nobody's going to make them any better than number one. Right. <laughs> to me, it, it would it's a be tough a job for the next thing. guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, good luck to the next guy because if he goes to number two, then you're evidently a failure as a coach. So I always looked at it <clears throat> differently that that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. It makes so more sense to be fired if you're 70th in the world than number one. But so uh, you're in your prime, you're out catting, and you're looking for a bag, and there's four guys that call you, Cam Young, Will Zalatoris, Hovland, and Morikawa. A after thinking about it, where would you go? Assuming that's, you were going to do that. <clears throat> that's a very interesting one because, um, you know, all of them have different qualities. Now, Morikawa is a wonderful, wonderful player seems to have developed a, <clears throat> a couple little chinks in his armor here, you know, under the gun. And there's nothing about him that you would have ever thought that, you know, a wonderful guy, uh, salt of the earth. Uh, but, you know, he's got some pitching issues, uh, maybe some putting issues. Um, Zalatoris is injured. Okay, he's calmed down a little bit. And Hovland's uh, got short game issues. And and so it's difficult to caddy for a guy when he's hitting pitch shots and the, and the player's thinking he might stick it in the ground. Because <laughs> nowadays the, the elite players are unbelievable around the greens, really. So with that said, I think I'd go to Cam Young. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to have issues yet, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's played good in primetime events. You know, he's had a chance to win majors. He didn't lose them. Somebody else beat him, but he was there. He certainly never looked uncomfortable. So I think Morikawa is probably the, one of the real interesting players to me right now because everything about him seems so solid. But, you know, losing a nine-shot lead on Sunday is highly unusual in golf, but, which, which he did in Hawaii. And he's, he's struggled a little bit around the greens. And guys, that, uh, when I do short game clinics, I say, if you're worried about contact when you're around the greens, it's over with. Because <laughs> you don't even know what hole you're on. You know? And so he, I think, and, and Hovland's a little bit the same way. And they're both bowed left wrist players. 
which introduces the leading edge. And they both kind of stick it in the ground. And so not all bowed left wrist players were bad around the greens, but dad, who was bowed with his left wrist, knew enough about it to play with a cup left wrist around the greens. Okay. So uh, that's a very good question. And I think my answer would be Cam Young. But you mentioned he's a tourist. We don't know what's going to happen to him physically. Well, you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned about Morikawa losing that nine shot lead. Did did you ever, did Jay Haas ever have something that yes. dramatic that he had to come <laughs> back from? And how do you deal with that? Uh, <clears throat> Not good with dates. I think it was it was either 80 or 82. Uh, Jay won at Pinehurst. Um, shot 66 the last round, I think, and came from three back. And then went to Texas and won at uh, the Texas Open at Oak Hills in San Antonio. And that was kind of fun because... Um, he was tied for the lead going to the last round with his friend and college teammate, Curtis Strange. So it was just the two of them in the last group. It was interesting. They hardly talked at all. And uh, Jay ended up beating him that day. There was a funny story there. Uh, I had helped Curtis with his bunker game, giving him my dad's uh, technique and systems. And on, I think it was the 13th hole, it was a long par three and, the, and there was water left, but the pin was in the right and he missed it in the right bunker. And he didn't have much green to work with. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I was thinking, isn't this something? This guy's going to use this technique that I taught him of my dad to end up beating, <laughs> beating us in this tournament, you know. And he played the most beautiful bunker shot. And Curtis and I were good friends and still to this day, very good friends. And he comes out of the bunker and I'm kind of staring at him because I can't believe that this is, you know, in the back of my mind, this might end you up use that against me, yeah. you know, going to end up costing Jay the tournament. And Curtis makes eye contact with me and smiles and gives me the finger. <laughs> 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 and it was just a great moment. You know, it was one of those things. That it was a perfect response because he knew what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. I knew what he was thinking. You yeah. see? And nobody else saw it, okay? He just kind of put it over his chest. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, this is kind of, this actually makes it okay the way, because yeah. he knew what was going on. So, and I think the next yeah. tournament was Abilene. He had a tournament in Abilene, the Legit Classic. I want to say Jay finished in the top 15. So he's on a hot streak and we go to Disney World. And he has a five shot lead going the last round. So we're we're on. And uh Met section little Billy Britton shot like 64, and we were in the last group of Sutton. Sutton shot 66. I think Jay shot 72. So a lot of times with a five shot lead, 72 wins, you know, but it didn't. And I remember uh going into the scorer's tent. And it was like you took all the air out of the balloon because you've been in contention now for almost a month and it takes something out of you. And it's been a great run. I, I don't recall being unbelievably disappointed. I, 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 Even back then, I had perspective of what a great run this is and how hard golf is. So uh, <clears throat> we were walking out of the scores tent and I said to Jay, man, it's been a hell of a run, you know. And as... Now his oldest son, Jay Jr., was a, just a toddler. And he said, I don't worry about that. He says, Jay was sitting on my lap when I was signing my scorecard, and he crapped all over me, so I'm already back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, no, look at me. <laughs> you, you woke up a story that you it told brought me. brought me down to earth real quick, you know. That, that tends to happen. Oh my goodness, that's great. So you talk about that lesson that you gave Curtis, but you you told us this story and maybe we'll bring it back to Augusta. You you got so many great stories about having your dad having lunch with Hogan and was it Carrie Middlecoff and Carrie Middlecoff wanted a bunker lesson and yeah. Hogan was trying to dissuade your dad from doing that, but you went and did the right thing as did your dad. It's pretty cool how that's that that is. But you know, I think um and dad did feel this, that um, uh, 
even though he obviously was a very good player, um, to him as a teacher, it's a nice feather in your cap when someone of that, you know, quality asks you for help. So that that kind of makes you feel good. <laughs> obviously, uh, wasn't the type of thing that uh, Ben liked because he wasn't a teacher. But uh, no, that was that was funny. I I think even to this day. Uh, when I give lessons, uh, we were brought up that rank doesn't have privilege; it has responsibility. So when someone comes from a lesson, you gotta you gotta perform. You know, your reputation really means nothing relative to how's this, how am I going to teach this person standing in front of me and figure out a way to get the job done. So even people signing up for your lesson book is, in in many ways, a compliment. And you have to look at it that way. Well, so on that note, when you get back east can you put me in your book for a bunker lesson yeah i'll go down there with you i'll, I'll get you out with one hand you, i was giving have... the guy a lesson yesterday <laughs> he was a member of the olympic club in san francisco he was probably in his mid-30s and his dad came with him and his father was the brother of a very good friend of mine from uh, oak hill country club so i had a, a family connection and this kid was a terrible bunker player and uh so dad taught us to get out of the sand with one hand so I can do it very easily. But I set it up beautifully all the time. And I hit a couple things and I demonstrated some of the four or five things that you should think about. And, uh, and I hit a few and I said, you know, actually, uh, if you do it properly, it's not that hard. I said, my father taught us how to do this one handed. I said, I don't do this very often. It might take me four or five to get it, which is all a setup as i could do it and uh so i came out and i hit this thing about three feet and the father and the son they they knew that it had to be a setup you know yeah. they started laughing and i said i <laughs> i did set it up perfectly but <laughs> and so i think which that, hand uh, left or right oh right yeah, yeah. not left. it's all right-handed my dad was uh uh almost all of his short game stuff all the high ball stuff uh, was dad was right-handed so um so we were taught that uh anytime you wanted to go high it was more right-handed stuff anytime you wanted to go left low it was probably more left-handed stuff but i think the intriguing thing about my dad is he figured a lot of this stuff out uh, all those players figured it out without technology or teachers or uh Trial and errors or anything you know and, and so it seems to me that a lot of the players nowadays have short spans where they play good. And some of the guys that learn the game on their own, they played good for a longer time because they didn't have all the information and they kind of own their swing. You know, I was looking for some reason, I, I, I was thinking about something different in my swing recently. And, uh, so I thought of a guy who might have done what I thought I was working on with Julius Boros, you know. And so in our growing up, if you went and watched Boros play at uh, Westchester or something, you would say, man, that was a beautiful swing, you know. No one ever put Julius Boros' swing on YouTube, right? But they put Ann Van Dam or Robert Rock or Grant Waite, all good players. I'm not knocking them, <laughs> but they ain't Julius Boros. So why would you put swings up on YouTube of people that are marginal professionals and you've got Bernhard Langers and Boros and guys, middle cough, I think won 38 tournaments and three majors at a big dip, but why don't you study his swing? Why are you studying? Why are we studying swings that uh, are just aesthetically good looking, but they don't necessarily produce under pressure? Because that's what a good swing is, one that produces yeah. under duress. Well, I think that, you know, I think dad had Hogan's secret right. He said his secret was the same as every other good player's secret. He knew his own swing. Nobody ever swung like Hogan. You know, they like to say Newton did, but, you know, it had some similarities, but it didn't look like Hogan to me anyway, it didn't. Uh, for as great as Hogan was, he had very fast tempo. It was uh, rather a quick, quick tempo. So I think, you know, copying someone's whole swing, I think, would be a mistake for a good player. I think you can pick out something. But most players don't know what they're doing. They tell you that they're doing this, and then you look at the video, and they're not doing it. 
you know, Bob Goby, when he won the Masters in 1968, I've spent hours with Bob, uh, one of the great storytellers of all time. And I said, Do you, can you remember what your swing thought was when you won the Masters? He said, oh, yeah, you kidding? He said, I missed the cut at Greensboro, so I got down there on Saturday, and I couldn't hit it. I was hooking everything. And he said, Sunday afternoon, I was hitting balls. And he said, I always felt I swung too far inside out. And the more I swung inside out, the more I hooked it. And subconsciously, the more the ball went left, the more I swung to the right, which made it hook even more. And he said, my swing thought was I was trying to hit my left knee with my left hand on the downswing. So if you swing inside out, the hand would be going away from your body. And, and so that was his swing thought. And he said, every shot I hit that week, he said, it was unbelievable. I'd look up and it would just be the prettiest, you know, soft draw. He felt like he was coming right over the top of the ball. Now he wasn't hitting his left knee with his left hand, but that's what he thought he was doing. Right. And so a lot of times the elite players back to Claude's theory on this stuff, and my brother Dick took it one step further. He used to say that great players are one swing thought away from shooting 64. They don't need swing overhauls. But nowadays, the players are so used to having coaches and someone hold their hand. Don't get me started on this. Uh, you know, guys that can't break 90 are telling these guys how to play golf. I find it to be a little bit alarming myself, but. But they're used to it. They've had a coach since they were four years old. So it's not their fault. It's just the way they grew up. It's their life experience. And I get all that. Mm -hmm. But I often wonder um, if Michelle Wee never had another lesson from the day that she almost made the cut at age 13 in the Hawaiian Open, would she not have been better? And I think we all know the answer to that. Just okay. had someone that tweaked her. Said, oh, you got the ball back too far. Or you know, your stance is too open. You know, you're going to take that swing and you're going to overhaul it and redo it. Unbelievable. Most mismanaged athlete in the history of my lifetime. But I, I, I blame her parents and I blame the teachers, you know, because, see, the teacher wants to put their stamp on it. So anytime you go to get a lesson in the the teacher is more interested in how it's going to make them look than what the students do. And I think that's not good. I, I tell uh, parents that bring juniors to me. And as Bill knows, we have different training on how to live our lives. I say, you know, I might not be the, the coach you want for so-and-so. And they go, how come? I say, because I'm going to care more about them as human beings than I'm going to care about their golf game. Their golf game will find their place in this game. But I care about them as people, you know. So if you're looking for some guy to be a helicopter coach, I'm not the guy. I'm not going to every tournament. In fact, I'm not going to any of them. Right. <laughs> you know, you want to come here and work on this? I'll tell you what I think. But uh, I'm going to teach them to be independent. I'm going to teach them to stand on their own two feet. I'm going to teach them hopefully not to need me. I have a girl that I teach who will remain unnamed because she's very young, but she she's qualified for four U.S. amateurs by the time she was 15. Oh, she's good. Wow. And every time she comes for a lesson, she's from China, she already misses a shot. She's the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life almost. Never seen anybody like her. With a not a picture perfect swing, it's her own swing. And I said to her a couple months ago, and I don't know where it came from. I said, you know, Angela, you only need to have three mentors in this deal. Number one should be self-knowledge, you. Number two should be experience, you. And number three, you only use that one. Not one and two doesn't work. And that's a set of eyes. And if that's me, that's fine. If it's someone else, that's fine. But don't let anybody change it dramatically what you're doing right now. Stand on your own two feet. You're as good a golfer as I've ever seen in my life. And I, I mean that sincerely. With an awkward swing, kind of, not awkward, but some, when you slow it down, a couple of funny looking positions. 
and her father always wants me to change these positions. And I said, listen, I'm not teaching you. <laughs> You're not a golfing genius. Your daughter is, all right? And the golf ball likes what she's doing. Kind of like Lanny Watkins, what dad was telling Lanny, you know? And so why would I want to put take a young girl who's incredibly gifted uh, and put my stamp on her? If I'm a good teacher, I'm supposed to teach her so she is better. I already have a good life, you know? My teaching credential is not going to uh, change because of this young girl. Her life will change. I remember my brother Craig worked for worked with uh, Jeff Sloman. I always joke he worked with Sloman since he was this high. Well, Jeff's always been this high. <laughs> He's about five foot four. And I was working for Craig at Oak Hill, where Jeff is from. Rochester, New York is a phenomenal golf town, just incredible golf town. And Jeff wins a PGA in 1988, I think, at Oak Tree. And the phone is ringing off the hook. Craig was his teacher, his mentor and everything. And the local sports writer said, boy, your life is going to change, Craig. And Craig says, no, my life isn't going to change one bit. Jeff Sloman's life is going to change. I've got a ladies clinic tomorrow at nine o'clock. This will have zero effect on my life. The only effect on my life that it'll have is I'll get to see Jeff Sloman's life improve. Now that was a very, very, very cool way of looking at it. Craig wasn't teaching to make himself look good. He was teaching to change Jeff Sloman's life. And so I, I have adopted that thing that teaching isn't about me. It's about the student. I think that's and, what makes the Harmons the Harmons. Yeah. Well, once again, that's the upbringing we had. And it, and it all started, as you know, at Wingfoot. But without knowing it, it started because Wingfoot is one of the few clubs that seems to really um, have a quite a respect and interest in their golf pros. And so when dad had all these great assistants that he was helping, who all swung differently, by the way, <clears throat> I think we just saw this. We didn't really know what we were looking at. And uh, somehow um, through osmosis, it was transferred to us that, you know, you teach these players and it's a great thrill to teach them. It's a privilege to teach them. And then, you know, when Dave Marr won the, the PGA, I was sitting in our den, not sure, maybe 65, is that one? And I remember my mother and father crying. And as a kid, you don't really see your parents cry much, you know. And that was the third time I saw them cry. They cried when I won the New York State Boys at Briar Hall. I don't know what they call that now. And my dad cried when Craig and Dick got beat by Bogart and Brown and Al in the finals of the Anderson. But I think they were like 17 and 19 and Bogart and Brown and Al might have won five or six. Dad knew that they were better than <clears throat> his two boys, but dad was proud of them. And so uh, I don't think he was crying because it made him look good. He cried because he got to participate in something pretty special, you know which is kind of unusual these days because now we've got all the teachers are like Tarzan, you know, when their player plays good, they're right there. But when they miss four straight cuts, they don't seem to jump up in front of the cameras readily. When you look back at that, uh, Claude helping Dave being that eyes, how, how, have you ever thought of the list of great players that he was eyes for? I, I mentioned Gary player. Cause I think I saw him taking a you list. Know, what I, what I think of now because, you know, and we've talked about this. Um, yeah, I'm in my 70s now. And in November, we went and played Augusta. And after dinner one night, I don't know if I told this story already, have I? Yeah, you you guys were waxing in the locker room? Yeah, you know, and, and I think when we sat by dad's locker, we both, we all three of us got kind of emotional but I think what really happened is our whole golf lives hit us at once. And, you know, the, the wing foot stuff and, you know, how the hell did we get here? And so what I, I think about all the time, but I think about it in a, a, hopefully with grace and dignity and humility, 
when I look at what our family has been involved in, starting with dad, which started with Craig Wood, which started at Wingfoot, and to look at this body of work that this family has had the privilege to be involved in. I don't really, it's not for me to say how much we gave to this, but we've certainly been involved in some stuff. It's pretty unbelievable, really, when you think about it. And Golden age long, and modern age. Long time. It's just so incredible. And, and dad's tree is still growing because the Harmon tree is still growing. Now, Butch, Butch missed getting in the Hall of Fame uh, a few weeks ago by one vote. Wow. And somebody asked me, was that disappointing? And I said, well, let's see if I can separate this. Butch getting in the Hall of Fame and my dad not being in the Hall of Fame, to me, wouldn't be right. Because if you look at dad's tree, which has gone on with these assistant pros, and then his sons had club jobs and their assistant pros got jobs and they taught them the Harmon way. This tree is growing. As I sit here, the tree is still growing. Uh, Butch had a good branch on that tree, but it wasn't his tree. <laughs> so dad's, what he's left to the game through playing, teaching, mentorship, all kinds of things is still being, uh, taught by my brother's assistants and their assistants who are going on to get head jobs all by the way starting at Wingfoot and so I think when I was sitting up there all of this just kind of hit me how lucky we've been to be involved in this thing because um, it seems like a lot of times not always there's a few families that have you know the Mannings come to mind they've obviously been more proficient at what they're doing than we've done um but for some reason i think that the the kids of um i don't know if dad was famous but he was in the media they don't usually flourish it seems like i don't know why that is but it's, so i think what we've done uh as i look at it now is quite humbling and i've said it a million times on this show it all goes back to me from my it all started at Wingfoot. You know, what you're talking about, that has a lot to do with your father, though. Um, oh, absolutely. Because following in, in, a, in, a, in a brilliant man's footsteps is and always going to be mother, difficult. My mother had a lot to do with it. That's right. Who's your uh, dope out the betting form for the Masters? Okay, as Billy would say in a racing term, who do you like this week coming up? Oh, about three months ago, I put $100 on Dustin Johnson at 26 to 1. Uh, if I had to, I think it's real hard. Uh, I think Scotty Scheffler, he has everything for that course, his short game, but Scotty seems to have, uh, to be born with, uh, very good nerves. So anytime you go to get a lesson and the, the teacher is more interested in how it's going to make them look than what the students do. And I think that's not good. I, I tell, uh, parents that bring juniors to me and as bill knows we have different training on how to live our lives i say you know i might not be the, the coach you want for so and so and they go how come i said because i'm going to care more about them as human beings and i'm going to care about their golf game thanks for joining Billy us Casper, today billy Horner, we really appreciate your double feedback. indemnity and please Marky. subscribe to the Two show hour. And hit Claude the bell Harmon. icon so you get notified. Movie classics. Of new episodes. Mark Gable. Hit them hard. Job. And hit them off. Best 36 holes.